Historically, astronomers didn't know how stars, star clusters, and nebulae were distributed through space. Sure, they saw them, and they knew that the fainter ones were likely further away, but the question remained, primarily because there was no reliable method to determine the distances to these objects. Astronomers simply didn't know how big the universe actually was. They, of course, had looked up at the night sky for centuries and were able to identify a whole plethora of different types of objects, but a few certain things stood out to them. Take, for example, the Andromeda Galaxy. We know that it's a galaxy, but just over a hundred years ago in the 1920s, astronomers were still working to figure out the details of these things that they called spiral nebulae. Some other mysterious objects in the night sky were the large and small Magellanic Clouds, which we now classify as galaxies as well, but the astronomers of the 1920s were still baffled by these celestial clouds. The modern-day astronomers of the 1920s saw these stars and clusters and nebulae in their observations, but the one thing that they couldn't get quite right just yet were these oddly structured spiral nebulae, as they called them. We look at these images now and think, oh, duh, that's a distant spiral galaxy. But astronomers like Heber Curtis, working at Lick Observatory near San Jose at the time, didn't know that yet. He had a feeling that these objects are not part of our galaxy, but there really wasn't a consensus on whether or not the Milky Way was the only galaxy out there. Were we alone? That was the hot topic of the Great Debate of 1920 described here in its 26th of April press release as follows. This evening, two California astronomers will discuss the size of the universe and present their views as to whether or not there is only one or several universes before the National Academy of Sciences, which is now in session in Washington. In 1920s scientific lingo, the word universe was used in place of where we would use the word galaxy today. So this basically meant that the two astronomers were about to go head-to-head -head in a heated discussion regarding the scale and the multiplicity of the universe. Was there more than one galaxy, and are we that only galaxy or not? In the program for that day, it was advertised that the debate would begin at 8.15 in the evening to be followed by conversations with the scientists afterwards. Each speaker individually presented their theory during the discussion, and then held that joint open forum in the evening for questions. Mount Wilson Observatory's Harlow Shapley argued that while we may not be at the center of our galaxy, our galaxy is the entire universe and it's much bigger than we previously thought. These spiral nebulae that everyone's so caught up on are just celestial objects in the Milky Way. Heber Curtis, however, argued that these spiral nebulae are island universes of their own, located far away from our own island universe. Now, there was no immediate winner of the debate. Each of these two scientists would go on to publish an article in the May 1921 issue of the Bulletin of the National Research Council, where they focused on the validity of their own theory, while also providing counter-arguments against the others in hopes of disproving it. But a resolution would only come after Edwin Hubble steps into the picture. His observations of the Andromeda Galaxy in 1923 showed a star that he had not noticed before. Originally believing it to be a nova, he continued to photograph the Andromeda Galaxy and realized that this new star was actually a Cepheid variable. Now this was the golden needle in the proverbial haystack because he had found something in the Andromeda that would actually yield a calculation to the distance to that galaxy. These are the more recent images of the very same star that Hubble observed, taken by the telescope that is his namesake, the Hubble Space Telescope. And the same four images are superimposed here on an image of the Andromeda Galaxy itself for context. Now the question was, was the Andromeda Galaxy, or the nebula as they called it at the time, part of the Milky Way Galaxy or was it a standalone object all by itself? As it would turn out, Hubble's distance calculations using Levitt's law for that Cepheid variable called V1 yielded a very large value for the distance to that star. This Cepheid variable was so far away that it could not have been within the boundaries of the Milky Way. The Milky Way itself measures only 100,000 light years from one end to the other, and the Andromeda's distance well surpassed that. It would be impossible for the Andromeda to be a feature of the Milky Way if it's found nearly two and a half million light years away from us. With that in mind, Hubble was able to confidently say that the Andromeda was a standalone object after all, 
it was a whole galaxy on its own. This implied that many of the similar great nebulae or spiral nebulae that astronomers had been working on previously were now going to be reclassified as galaxies. So, who won that great debate? There really was no one winner. They were both right on different accounts. Shapley was right to say that we're not at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, and Curtis was right in saying that the spiral nebulae are actually individual isolated galaxies located at vast distances in a much larger universe, to which we all belong. Here we can see a modern representation of the relative distances and inclinations between the Milky Way, Andromeda, Triangulum, and other nearby galaxies. In fact, the Andromeda and Milky Way galaxies are on course to collide in the near future. In the near astronomical future, I should say. The following series of images simulate the changes that we'll see in the night sky when that finally happens. Though, we probably won't be around to see it ourselves. So enjoy! Enjoy!